Hello. Um, in this session, I will walk you through how our team uh, designed a multi-tenant cluster architecture uh, to host different type of workloads and application with ensuring security between uh, cross tenants and workloads. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Ahmed Bibars. I'm a software engineer at Delivery Engineering in the New York Times. Uh, I'm excited to be here, but as you can see, like I'm a dad, gopher, build a lot of uh, Go applications, uh, Kubernetes operators, Love to build on AWS for work and hobby as well. And I'm a scuba diver, so if you have a recommendation for diving, just let me know. We can talk. Uh, so before we start, let me tell you a little bit about the New York Times. Our mission is simple. We seek the truth to help people understand the world, and we are doing that by aiming to build the essential subscription bundle for every English-speaking curious person who seeks to understand and engage with the world. And we are doing this by a different set of products. So news and journalism is the main and the most recognized product that we produce, but we also have different set of products, games, if you're familiar with crosswords, uh, spelling bee and other th things, uh, cooking with our amazing recipes and the athletic and the audio as well. So to get on the same page, here are a couple of distinctions to explain uh, the upcoming sections and make the picture clearer for you. When I refer to platform team, I'm referring to my organization, Delivery Engineering, which we build and maintain the platform and the tooling equipped with the platform to help uh, product engineering teams. When I refer to teams, that's our amazing engineering teams that build all of the set of products that I talked about in the previous slide. So here's our agenda. We're gonna talk about a few topics. Uh, why are we building internal developer platform at the New York Times? How did we design our container runtime platform? Why did we choose Cilium as a CNI for our cluster? We're talking about like policies and preventing unneeded escalations from happening. Talk about service to service operation and service mesh. And also what did we learn from the entire process? So I'm gonna start with the developer journey. When I talk about developer journey, uh, they do have journey like customer journey that we have. Uh, I have to try to identify the steps that most developers would go through when they're starting to develop their applications from collecting requirements, idea, planning, and all of the other steps. But all of this follows, and you can see me highlighting like few of these steps here, which these steps are the most common steps that we can work around and try to make them unified across all of our engineering teams. So we can make that developer experience in the platform seamless and give them like better tooling to help them deploy and deliver their application faster and in a much easier way. So let me give you an example. Here are a few colors. Think about them as color ballots, uh, and the ask here for each team is to mix them. So like they are representation of tools that we provide for teams. And imagine how you could use them to build an image or a picture. So this is an exercise we're gonna do together. So I'm gonna pause for like five, 10 seconds, asking you to come up with something in your head, but like how this would work for your team. Yeah, I know it's awkward. Uh, so we'll go through with it. So here we go. So like you can see, these are like different mixes of like the same colors. Like each person would have built like a different set of tooling processes around like the same toolings that we provide. So we provide like five, six tools, like each team will put them together in their own format, like trying to get their application delivery. So our goal here is to help identify and build identified experience for teams to make the process faster and easier and make them adapt their workflows in a seamless way to build uh, their applications. So, as I said, like we need teams to deliver their application seamlessly, so we identified this and we start to build around uh, this as a platform. So starting by creating and onboarding an application to the platform, uh, that's where like we come in and template all of the resources for the application to from like GitHub repos and uh, CI CD tooling manifest all of the things that they need to get their application working. And then that's where like they start developing and deploying code and logic for their application. And then we come to the CI CD where they build and test and deploy their application to the platform. We also like provide that's where the main talk is gonna be about, or like the run environment where like 
uh, the clusters and all of the configuration related to the runtime environment, which is built on EKS on AWS. And then we have uh, another beast for the routing, how application traffic is being routed between their services and users and other applications as well in the same place. But we also provide like a set and tool, uh, tool set of observability and uh, way to collect telemetry from their application across the entire uh, stack of the platform. So that's the developer journeys that we are looking for to create in the organization. So now, I, like I talked about why are we building the internal developer platform, let me talk about the runtime setups that we have. So we experimented with different setup for our cloud accounts uh, in the organization to build the environment on. And as you can see here that we came up at the end with a multi-account architecture because it allows us to do like a few things. First, like group workloads with common business purposes. If we need like and uh, have an isolation between like a specific business units, between development, between production and other things. But also like promote innovation. So like isolation between development and production account have to be separated. Uh, limit the scope of impact, have security, guardrails, all of the things that we need to have uh, for our development and building the platform. But as well, we could provide a lot of cost allocation for all of these accounts to provide us with like forecast and budgeting for the entire platform. So when it comes to building Kubernetes cluster, there's a dilemma because uh, usually platform teams goes between like, should I build a multi-single tenant cluster for my tenants? Like each tenant would get their own clusters or should I go with like a multi-tenant cluster? On one hand, having separate cluster for each team provide more control and isolation for that specific team, gives them like uh, all, of, all of that necessary and functionalities that they might want. Uh, but it also come with cost of like operational uh, overhead and like they have to manage all of this. And when you manage it for them, like you can't very like uh, couple the resources together. On the other hand, opting for a multi-tenant cluster can offer great resourceful utilization, simplified management, more agility in terms of like how you deploy your application and all of the tool stack. But you have a problem with like the soft tenancy part where like everything isn't the one bit. In, in one place. Ultimately, the decision to choose between multi-tenant, multi-single tenant clusters or multi-tenant cluster depend on various factors that I wanna walk you through how like we uh, put our factors and design consideration for that. So we started to look into the main design consideration and we came up with first network isolation that we need to ensure that each tenant come isolated by default from other tenants so they can talk to each other uh, when it's not necessary. So we can ensure very strict control over traffic. But then we have to come with like a framework for like rule-based access control. So when a tenant get access to the clusters, they can't like go accidentally delete other people's stuff or like mess with it accidentally. And then operational agility, I refer here more to traffic management and traffic splitting and how all of the service work together, how like I'm doing like intelligent routing between multiple version of uh, application as a developer. Talk about policy driven security, that's how we enforce a specific set of tooling and specific set of security standards in the cluster so no one accidentally do something that they are not supposed to, they get like uh, escalation to like a node or a machine that they not uh, they shouldn't do. And at the end, like we are talking about resource management, it's important to make sure uh, that they manage the resource efficiently and avoid overspending and ensure optimal performance uh, and have the workloads perform well while we optimize our clusters. So after careful consideration of our design requirement, we came to the conclusion that multi-tenant cluster are the best uh, fit for our needs. We recognize this approach can help us achieve our goals while also minimizing operational overhead for our teams. And to support this approach, we created runtime environment that could be distributed across multiple region to ensure failover and disaster recovery. Additionally, we connected these clusters to team cloud accounts, allowing them to expand just the use of compute to other resources as well. And it's important to note that there's no one size fits all, like this fitted our use case and our design requirement, but it could be very hard to fit into another organization. And from here to this, this is basically like a diagram on AWS EKS specifically that shows that we are choosing 
two regions, and you can see like in these two regions, we have multiple availability zone for each region, and that's where like we have high availability and like all um, clusters are connected together. I'm gonna talk about this when talked in the service mesh, but we also can see like this account in in specific uh, shared environment, it's connected to other accounts as well. So like tenants can expand and call other resources in their account, so we don't have to manage this for them. And we have like multiple environment, like this is replicated across multiple environment when we need, development, staging, production, other environment as well. Uh, and we manage the entire stack on uh, EKS uh, in my team. So if we wanna ensure network isolation and multi-tenancy in our Kubernetes cluster, we need to carefully select network components that will allow us to do that. And that's where we started looking into different CNIs and, uh, as options, and like Cilium was the one we decided on. Because before I talk about uh, uh, Cilium specifically, Cilium fits in a CNI, what is a CNI? So it's a container network interface, just a framework that dynamically configure networking resources, give you all of the sets uh, between like Kubernetes and the bots itself to do IBAM and all of the resources needed when you try to um, allocate IB for your uh, specific bot. And like there are different methods and how this can be done. It could be done in overlay mode, it can be done in different other modes. So why Cilium specifically? Uh, if you're familiar with like IB tables, like most of like the scene eyes use IB table for routing. So Cilium is abandoning this approach and using uh, EBBF at this point. And using EBB filter for routing means shifting filtering tasks to the kernel space, which shows impressive gains in performance uh, and promised originally. And like you can see, uh, there's a link down there about like uh, the benchmarks that been done by third party. So another consideration in the network isolation, we need to ensure that you can't talk, a service by default can't talk to another service. So we have a couple of things that we can use in the Cilium uh, space, which is extension of the Kubernetes API, like the Cilium network policy. At first, that's where like we can say, okay, this namespace can't talk to any other namespace. That's where we isolate uh, namespaces. And it provides like different type of policies from L3, L4, L7 capabilities, and DNS based as well. The other thing is like the policy enforcement mode. There are two modes. Uh, the default mode is good fit for most of the use cases. Uh, so with no initial restriction, but as soon as something is allowed, the rest is restricted. And the other policy enforcement mode, which always mode, what it, that's helpful for, for environments with tighter security uh, requirement. But we also can have uh, cluster-wide network policies. That's where like, you just like apply a single policy across all cluster, and that will ignore all of the network policy in the namespace. So that's more for a platform uh, specific. Observability is very important to us, and that's where Hubble from Cilium comes handy and like give you like a better understanding of like how the services are communicating with each other. From like a UI perspective, you can see like this is a screenshot that I took from one of the sandbox clusters that we have. But it's not just like a UI, it's also like you can see rich uh, network flows that are happening in Cilium and then you can export them and you can start look what's really happening between each service. On the other hand, there are set of metrics out of the box that you can see here between like endpoints, uh, how many endpoints created in the cluster, uh, also like things like drops, egress packets dropped and like allowed and as, a lot of other things. So let's talk about our Cilium setup. So we're using Terraform to provision our clusters. Uh, and because we are in EKS, like clusters comes with VBC CNI and Kube proxy, so we need a process to remove them, and we also need to configure the CNI, and then we're gonna install Cilium via Helm. We can do that manually, but like the idea here in that piece of code from uh, Terraform is like we can expand on how we organize this for each cluster. So in this scenario, I walk you through how like this provisioner will like call a script that will just like remove all of the necessary pieces that we don't want and install uh, Cilium at this point. So first portion, we're gonna start removing the AWS node. AWS node is the VBC CNI that comes along with EKS. And then we're gonna remove the Kube proxy because we're gonna depend on Cilium to route all of the traffic at this point of time. 
And then we're gonna apply the CNI configuration. Uh, and you can see here, like there are specific tags that we are applying. Uh, well, I'm gonna talk about in a second for the CNI mode, which like tags, which subnets to use, and like also which interface to start with. And then uh, talking about like the mask rating config and other things. And at the, at the last portion of it, that's where like we just install Selenium. So I mentioned the ENI mode, and then like I want to talk about how buds acquiring IBs. So in the AWS space, we need all buds to route to each other. Like the boss, you will handle like which bud that can connect or communicate with another service in that particular scenario. But in this use case, we're talking about like two uh, private subnets, one for the nodes that you can see the IB here in the 10 space, which like an ENI attached to the agent itself that will be able to provision IB in that space. And then we have another subnet, which is mainly for buds where like they have multiple interfaces. And you can see like these interfaces are acquiring IBs from a completely different uh, space, which is a hundred space. And like there are some in with one IB, but some others with prefixes. And in, with the prefix idea is that we can scale up how many buds that we have in the node. So like I believe it's about 16 X the size that we can do with just normal IBs due to the limitation of how many IBs that we can attach to a single interface in uh, AWS. So everything is automated. From a tenant perspective, like we created uh, an operator that will be able to onboard all of the accounts and tenants into our clusters. So the process is once, once an account is being created, like it will fire an event that will create the proper CRD and the operator will start like spinning uh, all of the resources needed to do that. So we'll start with network isolation. We know that your account has specific ciders for your VPC. So that's where like we say, okay, you now can talk to that specific set only. You can talk to the others because we have like a private IP space. But another thing that we need to apply here is you also can talk to the internet. So how you can do that. So we can tell like in Cilium, you can talk to other CIDR sets, which is zero. That means like you're allowed to talk to everyone uh, in that space if it's not disallowed. And we are restricting specific set, specific IBs. You can see here that we are restricting the instance metadata. So you can't speak to the instance metadata on the node that because like we don't want you to do that and acquire information that you're not supposed to. And we also can't speak to the entire private IB set that we have uh, in the organization. So I talked about network isolation. Now let's shift gears towards our back and how we can provide uh, tenants with control for uh, the clusters. So just quickly, Kubernetes, our back mechanism, our symbol, like you, uh, you are familiar already with like have a namespace, there's a role binding and there's roles and you can have like cluster roles that attach to a role binding that give a user access to a specific set of namespace or a specific resource and actions that they can do inside the cluster. And this is a simple tenant or back example that we have. So we are talking about like specific uh, ABI groups, we're talking about specific verbs, uh, get, list, watch, update, delete, that uh, based, based on resources, we're talking about config map endpoints, as well as like we are using here cluster role and role binding. So we have like a single cluster role uh, that applied in the entire cluster. And for each tenant, we give them a role binding into the space that automatically created for them. So they can now manage all the resources they need inside the cluster. But here's the problem. Verb and resources are not enough uh, because you can basically do a lot of things, but there are things and scenarios that we cannot work with. For example, like how we can ensure all buds have limits and uh, limits and requests in in, the, in their manifests, or how if we give tenants access to deploy uh, services, how we can tell them like you can deploy all the services you need except load balancing ones. But security policies also are not enough. So I will go back to the Kubernetes API flow trying to get to how we can implement this uh, beyond our back. So we're talking about API handler, basically like request comes in, there's like different components in Kubernetes that handle this, authentication and authorization. Authentication is one of the modules already comes with Kubernetes that 
uh, provide like analyze a request, see like uh, what credentials you have to allow it, authorization, see if you are applicable to uh, do the actions that specified in the request. And then there's like admission control, where like have mutation admission control with like can allow you to mutate your request so I can add specific uh, things to your request, then the validation, and then the, at the end, you write to a persistent data storm. So we can see like where Kubernetes ABI flow works. So what we can do is something simple. We can start writing a lot of validation web hooks. Like, okay, cool, let's start build a ton of them for each single thing that we need. Uh, it's basically that we can extend that and say, hey, for Create bad, just call the service and make sure you pass the request by. And if we don't want to allow this, just don't allow it. And it's simple, which that's dynamic admission control. The problem is that is not scalable. Like we're going to start like write a lot of validation rules and that's something that we don't want to maintain on the long term. Also, it can get complex uh, if you have like multiple validation uh, webhooks because like every single request will have to pass through them. So Whereas we're in the open source world, something that we could use. So we started to look into solutions and Gatekeeper was one of them. So what's Gatekeeper? OBA Gatekeeper is a serialized implementation of OBA, which is Open Policy Agent, provides integration with Kubernetes. And basically they come like with all the mutation and uh, validation admission controls that we need. And they also have Rego. And the first time I heard of Rego, it was intimidating when I started to look into it, but just once after you get past that, things will be fine. So that's where we're we using uh, Gatekeeper to provide more uh, methods inside like how we prevent users from doing things that they're not supposed to do. So a couple things here, Vivo, sorry, uh, Gatekeeper comes with constraints and mutations out of the box that we, you could use. So a couple examples here, like that's a container limit. So we're saying like containers must have limits. Another thing that we can say, mutation, please assign this metadata to when you have a mutation coming. And there are a set of uh, different constraints and different mutations that you can use. And there's a library for that. And I just left the link uh, for the library, which is called Gatekeeper OBA library. But beyond what shipped with Gatekeeper, we need to apply specific customized solution that fits our use case. One of the use cases that we ran into is, spoke about EKS, we spoke about multi-tenant. Now we have service accounts that using what's called ERSA IM role for a service account. And services usually use that to being able to call AWS resources. So we need something to use uh, an admission control that to make sure that you are only specifying the IM roles that you, you, you are you, using and you are allowed to that maps to your account. So that's a simple Rego policy that will allow us to not just to do that, but like say, hey, this is allowed annotation that you can apply. So we wrote a template for that and then apply it to the cluster. And the output, it's something like that. So we look at the operator will like know which account you're coming from because we already have all of this information. And this is the, like, the constraints that we are applying here. So we are saying like, for specific kinds, which service account on the specific namespace that's automatically created, please only allow the specific projects. And you can see like your account number will be listed here. So if you try to create a service account with an IAM role that doesn't belong to your service account or it's not mapped to, you probably will get a violation out of the box and that will give you an error that must match. And you can see the enforcement action here is dry run. We can switch that and make your deployment fail if we need to. So, so far we talked about Cilium, network isolation, we talked about roll our backs, uh, and now I'm gonna talk about like how services are starting to communicate with each other. So we're gonna talk about service mesh. And basically what's a service mesh in a world like there's a direct service ABI call, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the declaration of it, request and response, but we need something that will abstract a lot of things that usually developer uh, add to their application and like move this to a sidecar. So we'll have a control plane and the control plane will inject sidecars to your container out of the box and all of the functionalities that we need will get there. So why we need one? Because it 
can become complex when you start to like get service mesh, especially in a multi-tenant architecture. So we need it for a few reasons. First of all, we need it for observability. Like every developer will start to create their own web service and they will start to create their own metric. And we don't want this to happen. So we want to have a unified matrix across the board that we can say, okay, this service is causing errors for this service or something else is happening. Also one is security. So we're talking about MTLS. We talk about like which service can talk to each other. Um, and other things like traffic control. So we need like a, a way that we can say, okay, a route between that service, this version, and another version, and all of that kind of is already provided out of the box with a service mesh. And we don't have to ask developers to do any of that. So at this point, we already have an ingress mall in our clusters that get traffic from like north to south. So when I say that, like traffic coming from the internet will hit invoice. This is outside of the service mesh. So like we have envoy uh, containers on the clusters that will just route traffic based on a specific domain when a request comes in and match it to an upstream. So how we integrate something with our ingress model to a service mesh. So we created something like this, which is just like having Istio in place. Uh, have like these are clusters in two different regions and we have services deployed in both clusters and like with having an east-west gateway between these two clusters services can start communicate to each other so traffic comes from north south to like our envoy uh, interceptors and then they get mapped to the service and if a service in cluster in east region can start talk to a service in cluster in west region and all of that managed automatically by STO. So in a multi-tenant setup, we have the same concept of like having an S2 gateway per namespace per tenant. So that's where like Envoy uh, start to create like these uh, CRDs for us through our operator, which is something we done like this. So the operator will start like create an internal, we have already set up the load balancers and everything that we need from a gateway perspective. But then like we need to create like smaller pieces for each tenant. So like gateway for this tenant X and it's allowing traffic on HTTP and HTTPS and we define the domains that we get for each tenant. So I went too fast. Uh, and the last slide that I wanna talk about here is takeaways. I spent like some time trying to explain the process that we went through. And there are like a lot of takeaways that we can we can like talk about, like things like open source is great. Like we are, um, I already described like three components that we are using in our clusters that are already open source, like between STO, between Gatekeeper, between other things. But the problem is expanding all of that to developers is really getting complex because we're like I'm trying to introduce a lot of things to the developer. So I need them to understand like Kubernetes. I need them to understand like Istio. I need them to understand like all of the things happening to just deploy an application. So what we found out is that with all of the work that we've done to manage their infrastructure, we still need another way to give them a simple way to deploy their application. So that's when we started looking to like things like uh, open the, o, the open application model uh, where like things like we can just define one manifest that will do all of the all of the components behind the scene, and that's where like we are st still like in an early stage where we're trying to develop like more concepts to make it abstract uh, from that perspective. And that's about it. So, thank you. If you have any questions. Okay, so the question was like, we use AWS, like did we choose AWS before we start the project or we used it after? Uh, like we already chose to use AWS, we use different cloud provider as well, but for that specific project, we decided to work on AWS for the nature of like how other things are deployed into our cloud specifically. So EKS seems to be a, a fit, but like all I'm describing here is just the platform. We can like take the same platform and have it in another cloud. 
Yeah, so like the only B is that it might be specific like how our cloud accounts are being set up. But like other than that, you can like we can, we, we, use, we are using Kubernetes, which can fit in any other cloud provider. And most of the tools, tooling here is open source. So we can just deploy it to another cloud provider if we need. Okay, so the question it was more like, are we looking only for isolation or what other metrics that we are thinking about from performance and latency? So like if we are talking about isolation, yes, it's needed because we are in a multi-tenant uh, architecture. So like we can still like build smaller single clusters in, all of, uh, in a single account and they still gonna be like have lower latency. The point is like how to handle all of that when we scale. So like we are not running a single cluster or smaller single cluster like 40 nodes or 50 nodes. We're running like big clusters that like have hundreds and potentially going to up thousands of nodes that can scale at this point. So we are also looking for latency and scale and how we manage all of that for the entire organization. So yes, at the point that when we start, so, so the question was like, we are using Cilium, but can we get the same features or some of the benefits that Cilium provides uh, with the original things that deployed with EKS? So when we started like working with a project, like AWS CNI wasn't providing like a network policy that we can apply to isolate namespace. I believe they start to look into that and that's something they start to implement at this point. Uh, so you can use that. But if we are talking about like scaling performance, observability, all of the other components that we needed, Cilium for that and IB tables from like benchmarks showed that it's a little bit less. So if we can do it once, that's why we chose Cilium. But there are other CNIs that you can use, uh, especially like the VBC CNIs, there's Calico, there's other things that use similar uh, approaches, maybe EBBF, maybe not, but they can provide some other metrics as well. Okay, so the question uh, was, is this a multi-region deployment and how this is scaling? So yes, it is a multi-region deployment and really depend on like you as a developer from a perspective, the infrastructure resides into two regions geographically and split into multiple availability zones. So if we lose one, we have others and everything has the same scale mechanism. So like everything is like geographically split, but like we can scale each cluster separately if we need. And because we also split the, these between accounts and between environments, so like we treat production differently from dev, but each of them can scale up and scale down based on whatever your application needs. So you can deploy an application that requires like 100 buds, 100 nodes, and you can deploy applications that just require two replicas at this point. And you can deploy to east, you can deploy to west, you can deploy to both, and that's where our ingress model is helping because we have an ingress model that fits on top of like the two regions. So you can deploy your application and then route traffic from a single domain name and then have a failover mechanism that only applies based on like where is the request is coming from and based on load balancing and other things. Sorry, can you repeat the question? So the question is, uh, is it the same for the S for Istio? Yes, it is. So that's there's a north south where like traffic comes in, but there's an east and west. That's where other load balancers come between each cluster. So like any bud inside or any application inside the east region can talk to another uh, application in the west region and this is automatically comes connected so like they are discoverable and like 
For example, like uh, I was looking into it recently, if you try to get in points on a specific application, you will see like the internal IP address for your specific bot, but you're also gonna see like more IP addresses for the load balancers that traffic will start get exposed to. Go ahead. What is the question is, what is the typical uh, type of traffic that we run between east-west? So it, it really depends on like the nature of the application itself. So if you are deploying your application to one region, basically there's no like traffic will run east-west, but like there are some use cases where we deploy like applications into multi-region and that's where like one service need to talk to another service and maybe the service is not available in the east for, for a specific use case and that's where it goes to uh, the west or vice versa. So we have an application that it's being deployed to east and west and then another application only getting deployed into east. So that's where traffic will come from west to east to get uh, like all the ABI calls from that service. And basically it's anything from like data, like things related to news or like user information, services, things like that. Yeah, there are, there are some applications that require high availability if they are in a critical path uh, that need to get deployed to multi-regions just to ensure like if we have a failure in one region, we have another region that, to fit. But not every application fits this requirement. So there are some applications we don't want to get into a complex situation. So we have seen different use cases where it um, starts from like an application just like lives in one region and in one replica and just doesn't have any data stores. And then we have applications that like have hundreds of replicas with database replicated in multiple region with like hot cache, with like everything that it's necessary if one region failed that we can like go serve traffic from uh, the other region. So that's active, active. And we also have situation where it's active, passive, where like, okay, most of the traffic comes to the east region, everything served from there, but we have just another region on the standby if things happen to the east, automatic will feel over to that region. So there are different types. Okay, so the question is, We've been for a long time. Uh, if we fire an employee, how like we, okay, so yeah, uh, but like everything here is like basically single signed on. Uh, so like to get access to these clusters, it's tied to a single sign on. So if we just like activated or deactivated your access, that's where uh, we also can like deactivate specific accounts. So when we talk about the clusters, we basically grant you access to the clusters through your access to your account itself. So like you need to have access to your account first and then we create all the IAM rule and nested permissions to allow this specific account to speak to the cluster on that specific namespace. That's where like it's tied together. Once you lose access to your AWS account, you will not be able to access the cluster by nature. Any more questions? Okay, thank you all, appreciate you coming.